Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Newsam's Night TV studio and another edition of Inside Media. I'm your host, John Maynard. Well, last night, a little bit of Hollywood came to the Newsam with the premiere screening of the new, much buzzed about HBO movie, Game Change. The film debuts tomorrow night at 9 p.m. on the cable network. Uh, among the luminaries attending last night's premiere were Tom Hanks, who is one of the executive producers of the film, and actress Julianne Moore, who stars as Sarah Palin in the film. Well, we are pleased today to be joined by two men who also strolled down the red carpet last night, although I understand the carpet was blue. Um, Mark Halperin and John Heileman, of course, are the two authors of the 2010 bestseller, Game Change, in which the movie is based. And while we are going to talk about John and Mark's new Hollywood fame and their connections uh, in the making of the film, we're also going to take advantage of their time here at the museum to assess the presidential campaign so far and to look ahead in November. Uh, Mark Halpern is editor-at-large and senior political analyst for Time Magazine and also the creator and author of The Page, Time.com's popular political tip sheet. He's also a senior political analyst for MSNBC, where he appears regularly on Morning Joe and other programs on the cable channel. Prior to joining Time in 2007, Mark worked at ABC News for nearly 20 years, where he covered five presidential elections. John Heileman is the national affairs editor at New York Magazine, where he writes the Power Grid column in print and the Impolitik column online. John is also a political analyst for MSNBC and a regular on Morning Joe and other programs. Uh, John is also a former staff writer for The New Yorker, Wired, and The Economist. Please help me welcome Mark Halpern and John Heilman. Uh, gentlemen, again, I want to get to game change, of course, but let's, let's talk Super Tuesday. Uh, it was a little ugly, but in the end, Romney won the most states, he won the most delegates. Um, obviously, this thing is far from over, but Mark, is, is Romney effectively clinched the nomination? Well, he went into Super Tuesday far and away the most likely person to be the Republican nominee, and he still is that. Uh, and, you know, the, the way, the flow of the nomination process for both parties is always a little bit of a balance. Early on, it's heavily tilted towards wins and momentum. There aren't a lot of delegates at stake in Iowa and New Hampshire. They're not very big states, but they have a disproportionate influence on the process because they're early. At some point, you move to, from pure momentum to a balance between momentum and delegate accumulation. Mm -hmm. And then eventually, of course, it's all about delegate accumulation. That's the way you become the nominee. By any normal standard, Mitt Romney had a pretty good day on Super Tuesday. He won the most states, the most delegates, the most votes. He added to a pretty imposing lead, as his campaign points out correctly. Uh, unless something extraordinary happens, he's going to be the person with the most delegates mm -hmm. going, into, going into the convention. The, the, he, has, he has a couple of problems, uh, three problems really that I'd point to that, that take the luster off of the victory that, that he had on Super Tuesday, including winning Ohio, which was really important to him. Mm -hmm. One is that um, although he almost certainly will have the most delegates leading up to, s to the convention, at this point it's not clear that he'll have a majority of the delegates required to be nominated. And that means that he's in a little bit of a limbo situation. He can fight as hard as he can, he can do as well as he might do, and unless he does extraordinarily well, he's unlikely to, or there's a, I should say there's a, a pretty decent chance he won't have that majority. Second thing that took the luster off of it is that he did not do well in the southern states. So there was some talk that he'd win Tennessee, some talk that he'd do well in, some, in Oklahoma. He did not, he lost them both. And in the exit polls in those states and others, he continues to struggle with the, um, big important par portions of the Republican electorate uh, that are highly represented in southern states. Uh, and th the other thing that took the luster off of it is what's coming up. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the other contest this month uh, coming up in, in uh, the major contest, coming up in uh, Alabama, Mississippi, and then in Kansas and Missouri, those are four bad contests for them. And, and, and reporters sort of quickly pivoted from, okay, he did pretty well on Super Tuesday, to the reality that there is now something that there was a few weeks ago but wasn't going into Super Tuesday, which is I can now talk through a scenario where Rick Santorum knocks Mitt Romney out of the race. Uh, and you couldn't do that before Super Tuesday. You can now. Mm -hmm. uh, John, in your most recent column in New York Magazine, you categorize the Republican race as volatile, unpredictable, and just plain wackadoodle. Um, <laughs> how do you explain the GOP race this year uh, with all its various front runners, Michelle Bachman, Rick Perry, Herman Cain? Uh, I think there's, you know, the, the, you, there's only one way to explain it. You think about the, the fact that, you know, you, we went through uh, boomlets for Donald Trump, uh, as you said, you know, Michelle Bachman, mm -hmm. uh, Newt Gingrich briefly, uh, and then faded away. Uh, you know, Rick Perry, um, back to Newt Gingrich again. 
uh, most recently Rick Santorum, you know, some of those candidates, uh, Herm Cain, you know, some of those candidates uh, are, were never plausible Republican nominees, let alone presidents of the United States. Mm -hmm. And they all rose up quickly and then fell back very quickly, back mm -hmm. to earth very quickly. I think the only way you can explain that is that there's an underlying weakness in Mitt Romney as the nominee, as the, as the Republican frontrunner. And that is actually quite simply explained. He's not mm -hmm. someone that the Republican Party is an increasingly conservative party. It's more conservative now than it was four years ago. Someone in, in that piece, uh, a prominent conservative activist, Jeffrey Bell, talked about how you know, Mitt Romney was the conservative alternative to John McCain in 2008. He's running on the same positions as he ran on in 2008, basically, and now he's seen as much too moderate by a large part of the party. So the party has moved to the right gradually, um, and it's also become a more downscale party rather than a more, uh, it, it, the establishment wing of the party has weakened. The grassroots part that's a much more a party of the white working class has risen in, in power and in numbers. And those people, both ideological conservatives who find Mitt Romney wanting as a, as a genuine conservative standard bearer and downscale, culturally downscale voters who don't see him as one of them have been reluctant to embrace him. And for a lot of that year in 2011, he was stuck at somewhere between 20 and 25 percent nationally. There was not a state besides his sort of quasi home state of New Hampshire where he was uh, over that number. And he's continued to have problems breaking through over 30 percent, even as he's gotten closer to the nomination, as Mark said, in terms of you know, he's won states, he's won some very big victories in New Hampshire, in Florida, uh, in his home state of Michigan. He still, still is a lot of resistance. People are not enthusiastic about him. And so you look at um, the Super Tuesday, you, you put Rick Santorum and Newt Gingrich's totals together, um, and it's, it dwarfs Mitt Romney's totals in votes. Right. Now, that's, of course, an unfair standard. You know, that's the way it is. It's a split field. But those are not two particularly strong conservative alternatives. They have, they have glaring weaknesses, and yet a lot of Republican voters continue to gravitate to one of the two of them. That's the explanation, and it's the explanation for why Romney's had a hard time closing the sale. He's not really well in sync with, the, with, the, with where the Republican Party is today. I'll repeat a question, actually, that Charlie Rose asked you earlier this week. Uh, you know, if Romney does win the nomination, does he need a game changer? And if so, who, who would that be? Who could that be? Um, first of all, I, you mentioned Morning Joe in your introduction. I'll say that I appeared on Morning Joe this morning after attending the premiere last night. Yeah. So in my fatigue, <laughs> I failed in my initial answer to thank you and to thank the museum and all of you for coming. Uh, we really do appreciate the opportunity to be here and, and all of you uh, to come out. I'm going to take it as a sign either of the, the growing economy that you all have uh, jobs that allow you to take some time off or, <laughs> or maybe unemployment is the issue. But whatever it is, it's nice to see so many of you come out in the middle of the afternoon, so thank you. Um, you know, uh, you, there's only one standard to use when picking a running mate. The history makes, the recent history makes this pretty clear. You pick someone who's obviously qualified to be president. Um, it's not about a running mate who somehow people start to vote for you because they like your running mate. It's a, a, the first and best opportunity, most prominent opportunity for a presidential candidate to show the country what their judgment is, how they make decisions, and that they have good judgment. And the country clearly wants, and certainly the media wants, and the, the elites want, uh, a vice president who can be a heartbeat away from the presidency and step in and do the job. You have to pick someone who you can look the country in the eye and say, if something happens to me, this is the best or one of the best people I could pick to replace me. And if you can do that, then everything else follows. If you can find someone who satisfies that, if it's someone who helps you win a state, someone who helps you with the demographic group, great. But I have every confidence if Mitt Romney is a Republican nominee, and again, that's far and away the most likely outcome still, mm -hmm. um, that he will pick someone who meets that standard. Are there people who meet that standard who could be game-changing picks? It's not quite by definition uh, impossible to satisfy both, but it's pretty close. Because if it's somebody who the country either knows already or would quickly learn, uh, quickly meet and, 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 and get to know them, that's good. But by the standards of what, what it takes to be considered qualified, it's more likely to be someone from the establishment, someone relatively well known with a relatively traditional biography. So my guess is that Mitt Romney needs to improve his standing and, and deal with the kind of problem Senator McCain was facing uh, in 2008 simply by picking someone who's seen as qualified and then address those problems some other way. Picking a, a Hispanic running mate I don't think will address his problem with Hispanic voters. Picking a woman I don't think will help him. Uh, close the gender gap. Picking uh, someone who's not a Republican but an independent, I don't think will necessarily help him with independence. He should, and I think certainly will pick someone qualified rather than a game-changing pick. And he doesn't have, I think, the same kind of the, the premise of the question. Look, Mitt Romney has had a lot of problems um, in sealing the Republican nomination. 
Um, he's demonstrated many weaknesses as a candidate over the course of the last few months and has done himself some damage. Now, whether it's lasting damage or only temporary damage, but right now his uh, his favorability ratings are, are in, have, have suffered considerably. He's hurt with a lot of groups that we talk about all the time, with the ones that Mark listed. Hispanics, women's in, women and independents, those are, you know, that's where you win an election, and he's in trouble in all those areas. He might be able to fix those problems, but, but he does not have the problem that John McCain had, which is that, as Steve Schmidt has said, said on this stage earlier today at another event, you know, they were running, the Republicans in 2008 were running in the most inhospitable climate possible to Republicans in 2008. The country had rejected George W. Bush um, pretty categorically at that point. The wrong track number was over 70 percent. The president's approval ratings then were in the 30s. You know, it was hard to run as a Republican in that year after, four, after eight years of George W. Bush and in a bad economy and with a yearning for change and with a superstar who has had so much more money than they had as the, on the Democratic, uh, on the Democratic uh, top of the Democratic ticket, Mitt Romney's going to have a much more level playing field. And though we right now are really fixated on all his problems, at bottom, and this is something that President Obama's reelection team would say if they were here, we are basically back to being a 50-50 country again. Mm -hmm. The president's at right around 50% approval rating. The wrong track number for him is still closer to 60 than 50%. Um, the economy is still not great. Um, the Republicans are very motivated, despite some of the low turnout in some of these, in these primary states, they're very motivated. They will be very motivated to get Barack Obama out of office. Mitt Romney, at an underlying structural level, does not, is not in the bad position that John McCain is at. He has a lot of problems to solve, as, as Mark said, but he won't, I don't think the imperative for a change of dynamic, uh, change the dynamic kind of pick will not be as strong for him. And I think for those reasons, in addition to the ones that Mark listed, I think he will not feel like I have to throw a Hail Mary pass when it comes to picking or uh, picking a running mate. You mentioned Steve Schmidt. Uh, let's get to game change. We, we have a brief clip um, which documents the moment when uh, Senator Tim McCain is told by his advisor that he needs a game change. Let's run that clip. We can't win without our base. Lieberman is the right thing to do, but the wrong way to win. Who all have we vetted? Romney, Christ, Pawlenty. We're trying to vet Bloomberg. Who can we win with? None of them. None of them? John, Obama just changed the entire dynamic. It is a change year, sir. We desperately need a game-changing pick. And none of these middle-aged white guys are game-changers. Um, of course, Woody Harrelson as Steve Schmidt and uh, Ed Harris as Senator McCain. Let's talk about the structure of the film. Of course, your book was a sprawling account of the, of the 2008 campaign. Uh, but yet, uh, the book only covers the McCain campaign and its choice of Sarah Palin. Uh, columnist Byron York wrote last month, why did Hollywood focus on only one half of Game Change? The other half would have made a great movie. Your response to that, sir, uh, Mark? We prefer tightly constructed to sprawling, just okay. so you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, Bad choice of words and, on my and part. At, and yeah. at the risk of compounding the problem I'm trying to fix, um, when I made my joke about people being unemployed, I, didn't, I don't mean to joke about people being unemployed. Another product of my fatigue. That That's I okay. Um, you know, um, we approached HBO about working together on a film version of the book before we wrote the book and worked with them in tandem uh, for the last couple of years as they looked to see what would work for them as a, as a film. Uh, their original idea was to do, as Byron York and others have suggested, a, the story that is more of the book, uh, which is a great story about President Obama and Secretary Clinton and their fight for the Republican, uh, Democratic nomination. Just as a matter of production, telling a story that basically spans two years in two hours with many more characters and many more twists and turns, they just didn't think they could do it. And, and in, they commissioned a script, and the, what the script teased out was, this was really hard to do in two hours. So they were trying to figure out what to do about that. And along came our own game-changing moment, which is Jay Roach, uh, the director of Recount for HBO and a lot of uh, big Hollywood movies, was fascinated by the story of Sarah Palin and fascinated by it for the, the reason that a lot of the country was fascinated by it and fascinated by it in a way that, that, the same way that animated how we wrote about her story, which was less as a political story and more of a human story, how someone who was mother of five, uh, governor uh, just for 18 months, no experience uh, to speak of on the national stage, is plucked with a little warning and put out into this incredibly high pressure situation where she largely performs miraculously well but has a few high profile uh, uh, moments where she doesn't perform well and that to some extent defines her in a way uh, that, that creates a lot of additional challenges. So they said let's try this and, and the more they looked at how we structured the Palin uh, parts of the book and the more they thought about it that made sense to them as a two-hour movie and any of you who've worked in production 
uh, film or television production know that that is a medium that it has a lot of possibilities and opportunities, but is also pretty demanding. The, the, just the technical nature of telling a story in two hours, which seems like a long time, but really isn't. Even doing 60 days, the time Governor Palin was there on the, on the ticket, in two hours was tough. And so they turned to that. They, they loved it. Jay Roach, uh, to have a director of Jay's caliber do a, a movie for HBO again, as he did for Recount, was something they were very attracted to. And it sort of all came together in a way that made that story, again, not, not the dominant part of the book, but certainly a big story. And no one, uh, no matter what their political persuasion would argue, the story of John McCain's selection of Sarah Palin and what happened next, no one would argue that's not a great story to tell. Mm -hmm. And you, you mentioned you did sell the options to HBO uh, before you wrote the book. Uh, John, let me ask you, how did that guide you as you wrote the wrote Game Change, the fact that you knew that this would well, be well, a movie? It's, it's funny, you know, when we, um, stepping back a little further than that, when we decided to write the book initially, um, we were down here in Washington and just been to a McCain in the spring of 2008. We'd gone to a McCain event out of Annapolis and on the way back we started talking about how cinematic the campaign was, these huge characters and, and these dramatic plot twists and, and f kind of fancifully, one of the things I said to Mark was we, there should be a movie, you know, let's write a movie and Mark being much more sober and grounded than I am said, <laughs> you know, have you ever written a screenplay before? And I said no and he said, well, that's maybe, I've not done that either, maybe we should focus on something we actually know how to do. But, um, <laughs> It's good advice and good, good advice. So that's part of the reason why we're a good partnership. Um, you know, we, but we, we never lost that, though. And, and we never lost that notion, not only in the sense of optioning it to HBO, but as we did the book, we very much, I, I very much were thinking all the time about how to do the book in a cinematic way. Mm -hmm. We wanted there to be big scenes and big set pieces throughout where that were, you know, showing and not telling. We didn't want to do a lot of analysis. We didn't want to talk about polling and pollsters and strategy and strategists and exit polls and all that stuff. We thought that stuff had been pretty well covered in the course of the daily, weekly, and monthly coverage of the campaign. We wanted to tell this very human story and we wanted to stay focused as much as possible on the candidates and their spouses and to have as much dialogue as possible, to have as much description as possible, to have the thing read, not literally like a screenplay, but we wanted it to be a very, very vivid account. And as I say, with big set pieces and lots of dialogue and lots of character in it. So in some sense, we were sort of writing a, a book with a kind of screenplayish feel around the whole thing didn't change at all what we decided to focus on because we wanted to focus on things that were interesting and where we had good reporting and where we could tell people something they didn't know and things that were important about the characters but there was a very we tried to imbue the book with a cinematic quality and and I think from Danny Strong's stamp standpoint is part of the reason to go back to Mark's question one of the reasons why the Palin chapters the two of them worked well for Danny because he looked at them and there were sort of seven or eight big set pieces, and you could see the narrative beats were already built into the book. It made it, there's nothing easy about writing a screenplay, but this was something that made adaptation a little bit easier than other kinds of books. Well, let's get to the, the star of the film. I want to play uh, one of the stars anyway, another clip of uh, Julianne Moore as Sarah Palin. This is a scene depicting, I believe, her, the announcement uh, of her selection. Senator, I am honored to be chosen as you're running me. noted in Denver this week that Hillary left 18 million cracks in the highest, hardest glass ceiling in America. But it turns out the women of America aren't finished yet and we can shatter that glass ceiling once and for all. What do you think of Julianne's performance? I, I know obvious question is why not Tina Fey, uh, <laughs> who um, many people opinion was born to play that play that role. Ask me again what I thought of Julianne. What Julianne's do you think of Julianne Moore? Yeah. Okay. No, <laughs> just kidding. It's spectacular, and and one of the reasons we want to work with HBO is because they attract t talent to both sides of the camera. And you know, a lot of people when, when they've heard, even now, people haven't seen clips or the uh, thing, uh, they say Julianne Moore don't really get it. I don't really see the resemblance. Um, she, Hair and makeup helps a lot, but she did so much studying of voice and body language and, and, and sort of mode of behavior. Um, and um, the, the, from the beginning, when people said, when it was announced that they were going to do the, this focus on Governor Palin, people said, well, we're going to get Tina Fey. Tina Fey was a brilliant, funny caricature. Mm -hmm. That's not what HBO wanted. They wanted someone who would actually do a nuanced performance. Uh, and um, uh, I'll do a little bit spoiler alert here, so close your ears if you don't want to hear this, but <laughs> there's a scene in the film that's gotten a fair amount of attention of, of uh, where Sarah Palin, played by Julianne Moore, is on her plane watching a clip of Saturday Night Live <laughs> of Tina Fey playing um, Sarah Palin. 
And it's a great scene. It's one of everybody involved with the film's favorite scenes because, it, and you see the difference then. Again, the, the Tina Fey thing's brilliant, and it had a huge impact on the campaign in defining Sarah Palin on negative terms, um, unfortunately from her point of view, but, but you see the contrast there of a, a, character, a committed caricature versus uh, a really nuanced performance. And, and it's the same for Ed Harris. His performance as Senator McCain is not cartoonish. It's a really, uh, uh, it's a performance that is very nuanced and is based on, as it was with Julianne Moore, a lot of study of John McCain, uh, how he spoke, how he speaks, how he walks, and also, again, it's sort of an attitudinal thing that for those of us who know those two people, to see these characters, these actors in character on the set and in the film is really, really an incredible experience. There were pe world, people world class at what they do who took it really seriously, and the, the proof is in the pudding on the screen when you see it. John, another scene in the film depicts uh, Palin when she does accept the nomination at the Republican convention. I believe you were on the floor that night. I uh, was. Uh, Ex explain what her what that was like. I mean, I, electricity is probably the word that comes to mind. I, there, there's not been very many events that I can recall ever covering that were more chaotic and exciting and um, uh, wild than the Republican convention in, in 2008. You had, you know, they canceled the first day of the convention because of the, they thought that there was a hurricane that was coming. Right. Um, Sarah Palin had only been put on the ticket a couple days before and there were a lot of questions about her that they had not anticipated. And so there was a press frenzy around her mm -hmm. um, that's shown in the film. Um, there were a lot of doubts that were cast on her and a lot of uh, caricatures that were drawn of her in that period of time. And, you know, leading up to her speech, there were a lot of re Republicans, um, some publicly and, and more privately, saying, you know, she might have to be taken off the top of the ticket, uh, taken off the, the bottom of the ticket, off the ticket, you know, before this is over. Right. She may be too damaged now to go forward. We may have a Thomas Eagleton thing here where McCain's going to have to pick a new running mate. Um, so all of that is to say that the pressure on her on that night when she gave that speech and the anticipation around it could not have been greater. It, it, there's never been a, I, I can't think of a more high stakes moment right. because she could have just fallen like a souffle. If she'd given a bad speech, she might have had to be taken off the ticket. Mm -hmm. And she's never, she had never spoken to anything like that kind of an audience. This was not just an audience of the entire institutional Republican Party, but you know, an audience of many, many tens of millions across the country that were watching. Um, so the bar was very, very high and people on the floor were you know, vibrating as she came out on stage. And she came out and gave a speech that I don't think you could have done any better. Mm -hmm. I mean, she, you know, the, I hate to use the cliche, but she really did knock it out of the park. And standing there 50 feet, 100 feet from her, whatever it was, people were, in, they greeted her rapturously. As the performance built, they became more enraptured by her. She fed from the crowd. She got better as the speech went on, looser, um, more charismatic. Her natural charisma, which is, again, something you can't really teach a politician, and that Julianne Moore conveys incredibly in the movie, came greater and greater as it came out. You could see her political gifts, not just for, she, she spoke about her, her son, Trigg, special needs or Down syndrome child, in this very moving way. She attacked Obama with ferocity. I mean, I, you know, she was a multifaceted performance, and when she walked off the stage, I don't think there's anybody who thought at that moment that this wasn't like a, now suddenly a pick that had been imperiled 12 hours earlier suddenly looked like genius, like the political master stroke. And she rolled out of that convention. No one even remembers what John McCain said the next day. It was the, the convention at which Sarah Palin took over for that moment the hearts of the Republican Party. I do want to get to questions from the audience, so please raise your hand. And we do have two volunteers with microphones that will come to you. While the mic is getting to our first question, I, I do want to get to, of course, the criticism of the film. Um, Sarah Palin says it should be called fiction. Uh, John McCain was quoted as saying, it'll be a cold day in Gila Bend, Arizona, before I watch it. Um, <laughs> what would you say to the, to the former candidates? Well, let me, let me just respond more generally to people who criticized it rather than, than the, to those two particular people. Um, People should watch the film, and, and if they've got specific things that they're concerned about, uh, we'd love to hear them. But we haven't heard very many specifics. We've just heard people label it. And in fact, the film is accurate to history, it relies heavily on the book, which was also accurate. And it's a very balanced portrait, and in many ways a very favorable portrait of both Senator McCain and um, uh, Sarah Palin, and, and very many, a lot of people who've seen it, even people not favorably disposed towards one or both of them, feel that way about it. So, like I said, uh, if, if people want to criticize something they haven't seen, I'm not sure how to respond to that. And if, even if they've seen it, if their criticism is simply to say it's false without any specifics, um, it's, it's a sort of hard to respond. Okay. 
Why don't we start right, we'll set the mic right there. Hi, um, I'm kind of curious because uh, I'm kind of a faithful watcher of Morning Joe and other programs, and I haven't heard much discussion at all about what uh, the potential impact of Americans elect will be this, uh, in this particular election. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Do you think it's a viable uh, potential game changer? Well, uh, explain what it is. Well, Americans Elect, for anybody who doesn't know, thank you for advising me. I'm as tired as Marcus. <laughs> um, Americans Elect is a is an organization that has started uh, to try to uh, put an independent uh, presidential ticket together. Um, they have done an extraordinary thing in that they are in the process of getting access, ballot access, a line on the ballot in all the 50 states. They've they've gotten one. They're, they're, they've, they've done a, not, they're not all the way there yet, but it's only because there are deadlines that, they, that are yet to come, but they're confident that by June, they'll be on 50 states. That's a huge impediment to a, an independent uh, uh, presidential nominee candidate being able to compete is being able to be on the ballots in all 50 states. So they have set about doing that. They're gonna hold an online nominating convention that's sort of in the early stages of taking off right now that will, it's a rolling process that ends in late June, I believe, and the one the, the pe people who, it's a fully democratic process, so people go online, people get nominated, there's rounds of voting, eventually you'll end up with a, with a, with a, with a, with a nominee, and the ticket, the only, the only constraint that they have imposed is that the ultimate ticket will have to be a balanced ticket, which is to say, if there's a Republican is at the top of the ticket, they will have to choose a Democrat as the running mate, or vice versa, if Democrats at the top, they'll have to choose a Republican, and their notion is they want to try to create a, uh, a, 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 a unity ticket. Uh, a bipartisan unity ticket. Um, they are broadly centrist in their orientation, although there's nothing that actually keeps this, this ticket from having a far left person at the top and a far right person at the bottom. You could end up in that situation, it's hard to tell um, where we'll end up when they get there. I think the reason, part of the reason why you don't hear a lot of discussion about it is because in the case of, uh, of a third party slash independent uh, candidacy, it so much depends on who the person is in the end. Americans Elect has done, as I said, something really impressive by providing ballot access. Um, but in the end, they're gonna come in June, you're gonna end up with a ticket. They're not financing that ticket. So whoever is at the top of that ticket ultimately and, at, and, and whoever their running mate is are gonna look up in June and they're gonna have to compete in those 50 states that they're on the ballot with money that they raise at that point. Now we know on the Republican side, the Democratic side, this is gonna be the most expensive presidential election in history. So one question that people have is who, if this person, whoever these people are, will they be able to raise enough money to be competitive in a general election? Will these people be at all attractive to the American people? Will they be, you know, all of the natural questions that we have? I think we'll know a lot more about the potential impact of Americans elect when we know who those people are. Um, is there a place in American politics for a third party? Yeah, there clearly is, and there's clearly a huge chunk of the, of the electorate that hungers for more alternatives. And they've done a lot of polling that shows that that's the case, that people are open to the idea of a third party candidate, that they would be receptive to it under certain circumstances, that they're not wedded to the two parties. The, 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 the two parties themselves have been shrinking in, in size on a, on, a, on a secular basis over the course of the last 20 years. So there's a, there's a, there's a theoretical hole there to be filled. The big question is whether these, whether these guys actually end up filling it, and that really won't, we won't be able to evaluate until we know who they propose to fill it with. We have another question up top there. Yes. Is this on? Yep. Uh, I had a question uh, on a podcast I listened to recently. Obama said that he doesn't get his news from uh, network or cable television. Then Palin obviously had uh, the flap where she couldn't name a newspaper or magazine. And I think in the book, you said that she still read the uh, Alaska local paper well into the election. Uh, with your insight, how varied is it where these candidates get their news? And what does that tell us about the candidate? Well. Again, not speaking about any specific politicians, but in my experience, sometimes candidates claim they don't watch TV or read certain things, and they do. <laughs> they get a lot of summaries <laughs> of things from their, from their advisors, and um, you know, a lot of candidates, Governor Romney one, have iPads now, and they, they read a lot, of, they get a lot of news on there, things that are emailed to them as well as, 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 as content that they access directly. Um, you know, it, it is, it is the case that um, uh, running for president requires, and, and being you know, president or a senior elected position, requires a fair amount of focus and discipline, and not letting yourself be caught up in you know, reading the comments on a website that are attacking you uh, vitriolically and personally. So I think, to some extent, um, 
some politicians, and, and I think the president falls into this category. My guess is the president reads a lot less than he used to uh, because he's busier and because he has people summarizing stuff for him, but also because he's a pretty um, smart guy about staying focused. And there's a lot of stuff out there you could read about yourself that would maybe make you a little distracted, or not in the case of the president, because he's, he's got a pretty clear head about stuff like this, but there are a lot of politicians who would be made insane uh, <laughs> reading stuff about them. And, and one of the things you see in, in Game Change in the film is the Steve Schmidt character on several occasions is telling Senator McCain, stop watching cable TV. You know, and Senator McCain comes in and says, you know, I can't believe what Keith Oberman is saying about me. And the Steve Schmidt character says, never watch Keith Oberman. <laughs> um, so again, if you've got a well-run shop, you don't necessarily need to read stuff for yourself because you can trust the people there to send you the stuff you need to read. Um, and um, President uh, Clinton read a lot of stuff and would write annotations <laughs> on things and send them back to the staff. And my sense is President Obama does a fair amount of that as well. Right there, and then we'll go there. I actually have a question about the book. Um, going back to, um, well, I, I read it years ago, so my recollection might not be correct. I devoured it in the first week that it came out. So this might be a short answer, but I remember being surprised that you guys didn't cover the fight in the DNC over the rules of whether or not deceit the Florida and Michigan delegates. Okay. And I remember that being pretty dramatic just watching it on C-SPAN. And I was curious as to why you guys left that out. Was the game over? Was there no more reporting to do? Or was there just no more room in the story for, for that chapter? I was, I was keen to see it and was disappointed not to. We, we never like to disappoint a reader. <laughs> um, so we can write it up for you if you want. <laughs> you can insert it. Nor, 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 nor do we ever intentionally like to criticize a reader or a potential reader. But I will say that one of the things when we decided to write the book, literally in Washington, as I was talking about earlier, um, one of the things that we, uh, we made almost like talismanic uh, in the sense that, like, what are the kinds of things we're not going to write about in this book? The seating of the Florida and Michigan delegation was at the top of that list. <laughs> it was literally our example of what we wouldn't put in the book. <laughs> so we were destined to disappoint you from the beginning. Yeah. Because, because in a book that where we really focused, trying to be focused uh, relentlessly um, you know, about the candidates and their spouses and the human element of what it was like, the last thing we wanted to get into was arcane rules about, or arcane fights about delegate seating. I don't know, I don't, to this day I don't understand that fight. And, and, I, and I pay a fair amount of attention to what's going on. Um, it seemed like the most deadly kind of discussion to have if you were trying to, again, write about what it was like for human beings to take place, to fight, and we were trying to write the book in some ways, not as a political book. We always saw the book as, here's a bunch of really interesting people engaged in the most high stakes competition possible. What's it like for those people to go through that? How do they bring their strengths and weaknesses to bear? How are they changed by the process? How do they, the strengths and weaknesses, leave them to either triumph or fail? Um, those are, you know, interesting topics, but they're interesting topics for other books and other authors. Apparently a dramatic moment on C-SPAN, though. So, oh. okay. Brian I'm, Lamb with the popcorn there you and go. I'm compelling. Right there, sir. Yeah, it, it seems like a lot of the themes associated with the rise and fall of Sarah Palin are also reflected in the rise and fall of Herman Cain and Michelle Bachman. And um, would you agree with that, first of all? And if you do, what, why don't we learn our lesson at some point and quit, and quit trying to search for people out of the blue uh, to, to be our elected leaders? Well, I mean, I think that, that it's, it has always been the case in electoral politics, but now more than ever, that being a good communicator, being a physically attractive person, uh, being someone who can excite a crowd, those are all advantages. And uh, they give you an opportunity to draw press coverage and to uh, get an audience before the American people to make your case. Um, and so a lot of, I think that those, the, 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 the reason why those things are, are politically potent derived from human nature that is not going to change. So I think you'll see in every cycle, you'll see candidates uh, in an, uh, running in an open nomination fight who have those traits. And the key is to be someone like a Bill Clinton, who is every bit as dynamic and attractive and compelling as the people you named, but also was able to come forward with other advantages, other strengths that allowed him to take that opportunity in the spotlight and push it forward. Governor Palin, uh, is, is still a huge force within the Republican Party. She's one of the, um, uh, at least, uh, sort of ideological and attitudinal founders of the Tea Party, and, um, and uh, still is a relatively young person who has a chance to be a big part of, of the national discussion for a long time. So I don't know that 
th th there are lessons to be learned, uh, the same lessons to be learned from every, everyone you named about what, uh, what the um, staying power is based on the fact that they have certain strengths that, that, that are more superficial but are still really a big part of how you get your audition before the American people. Speaking of Sarah Palin, just this week, um, you know, I believe it was CNN, she both declined to write off the possibility of running in 2016, but even said, quote, anything is possible this year uh, if we face a broker <laughs> convention. Uh, is that a, first of all, is that a possibility, but wh what about 2016 if o Obama can, you know, takes a second term? Uh, if I was being excessively glib, I would say, God, I hope so. <laughs> um, she's a pretty good character. Sure. Um, look, uh, you know, she, I think that you know she has um, she's obviously tried since she uh, since her since the 2008 race, and then since she decided to leave the Alaska governorship, she has wanted to remain a force in American politics. Mm -hmm. She has done a variety of things to do that, whether it's um, giving speeches, um, staying connected to the conservative world, occasionally popping up in the course of this race to offer encouragement or criticism along the way. She, um, obviously on Facebook and other social media, she's tried to maintain visibility. I don't think there's that much doubt that she wants to continue to have a role in the Republican Party and a national, on the national stage. Whether that takes the form of ever running for president again, I, I wouldn't be surprised if she did at all. I mean, she continues to, for some of the reasons Mark said, and you know, we saw her at the conservative, uh, uh, at that CPAC, at the Conservative Political Action Conference here back in February. There was nobody among every Republican presidential candidate was there. Every major player in the Republican Party gave a speech. She was still packed the house in a way that nobody else did. She inspired enthusiasm in a way that no one else did. It was the last speech of the conference. Most of the time, by the end of the time you get to Saturday, everybody's gone home. Everybody stayed. And she was, again, you know, a lot of young activists there who were thrilled by her presence. So does she have a future? Does she want a future? I think she has one. If she wants one, I think she does want one. You know, whether there's going to be, I mean, I think the possibility of, of a contested convention is, is small, but not zero. And whether she could, in a contested or broker convention scenario, be the nominee in that situation, I think that's an even smaller likelihood. But, you know, sh the fact that she continues to dabble <laughs> tells you that she uh, wants to still be a player. Right. Well, we are almost out of time, but I did want to note that they are, uh, the, uh, Mark and John are currently working on a sequel uh, to Game Change, uh, chronicling the current presidential campaign. Uh, Obviously, you've had a lot of material to work with in 2008. You have enough material for the new book? We do, we, we, we do okay. already. Um, and it's early. Yes, it is. I forget. Did you, did you mention in talking about the first book, it makes an ideal Mother's Day or Father's Day gift? Not yet. Okay. That, I couldn't remember yet. I'm, that was I'm my tired. closing. That was okay. my closing. So. Um, look, uh, there's already been a lot of twists and turns. The, 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 you've got the Tea Party and the Occupy movement and, and unemployment situation. with incredibly volatile times in which we're living. You've got this Americans elect uh, potential out there. And remember, four years ago at this time, we did not have Sarah Palin, the financial crisis, uh, uh, Lehman Brothers, et cetera. So, um, or even a Democratic nominee. Yes. So there's, there's, there's plenty of material already, and there'll be plenty more. And uh, uh, the, the volatility of this thing, I think, suggests uh, um, we will not want for the game-changing uh, uh, plot line. And I hope it's not going to be called Game Change 2. Do you have any catch? Actually, you know, actually, I actually sort of like Game, game Change 2. This time it's personal. This time, okay. <laughs> um, I like it. Either that or gamey or changier. I like that no, one, too. No, no title till we know wins. What happens. Yeah. Mark Halpern and John Heilman, thank you for joining thank us today. You. The book. Thank you all. Thank you. A perfect. A perfect Mother's Day and Father's Day gift, game change. Are there any limits on the number people can buy? Uh, no, not at all. Not at all. We are selling it outside the uh, TV studio. Hope, and of course, uh, the gentleman will sign copies for you. Uh, reminder, our next Inside Media is Sunday, March 25th. Ron Suskind, author of Confidence Men, will be here at 2.30 in this very studio. We hope to see you then. Thank you all. Thank you.